wireless networking, it talks about more than just the 802.11 uh, series uh, uh, wireless networking. So if, if that's all you're expecting, there, there is more to it than just that. Uh, objective is explain how nodes exchange wireless signals. Um, if I remember, I'll try to mention it. If not, let me mention the, wire, the, uh, the uh, hidden node problem because I don't think the text covered it. Uh, identify potential obstacles to successful wireless transmission and their repercussions, uh, such as interference and reflection. Understand wireless LAN architecture. Specify the characteristics of popular wireless, wireless LAN transmission methods, including 802.11a, b, g, and n. There's actually a more recent one that's being pushed. It's not out yet, but uh, 802.11 ac, I believe, that they're talking about now. Uh, install and configure wireless access points in their clients, and then describe wireless MAN and WAN technologies, including 802.16 and satellite communications. Okay, so the wireless spectrum, a continuum, continuum of electromagnetic waves, the space that we have to, to transmit uh, signals. We can transmit data or voice communication across the, that spectrum, and they're arranged by frequencies, lowest to highest. We've got, starting out at the very low end, various radio frequencies, AM, for example, that we can transmit uh, um, information, all the way up to the high end where we can uh, transmit all kinds of stuff. Uh, so anywhere from around 9 kilohertz up to 300 gigahertz. Wireless surf, uh, services are associated with one area. So the wireless transmissions that we have for our computers, our wireless access points, operate within just a few various uh, frequency ranges out of this great big broad spectrum that we have access to. How do we control who has access to that spectrum, the different parts of that spectrum? Here in the U.S., the FCC dictates that. They tell various manufacturers that your product must conform to the standard. It has to stay within this range of frequencies. If it doesn't, they get sued, shut down, whatever. Uh, you might imagine that wireless technologies, radio technologies, uh, the, the, these broadcasts, they don't understand political boundaries. Why is that important? The ITU oversees international frequencies. You get out of the Mexican border and have a wireless access point there at the border, or to the Canadian border, or any other border for that matter, that signal does not cease at the border. It goes across. So we have to have some kind of way of making sure that our frequencies work nicely with the frequencies that they're, they're using in countries around the world. And that's really the responsibility of the ITU and the FCC works. They, those two organizations work closely together to make sure that that, that, that happens. So those various ranges, uh, 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 the, those ranges of frequencies, radio navigation, uh, marine uh, aeronautical devices operate down here, AM radio, et cetera, et cetera, you can kind of see. They're spread out across a, a large range of frequencies. So characteristics of wireless transmission media. In some ways, they're very similar to wired. There's a lot of overlap between the two. And it makes sense, you know, conceptually, they, they, they have to operate similarly in order to be compatible. But at the same time, there's some unique characteristics when we talk about operating wirelessly that force some, some differences to occur, and we'll talk about those. So similarities with wired, layer 3 and higher protocols are the same. TCP IP, you know, it's, it's, it's got, in order to be able to access websites and Things that and, and, be, and route uh, um, packets across the internet, we have to be able to use TCP/IP and, and HTTP, etc. A uh, signal origination from the electrical current or tra travel along a conductor. In other words, from our computer, when we type in a command, it gets sent down to our network card. All of that operates exactly the same. It's when it gets to that you know, traveling along to that conductor and getting to the port, the part where it leaves, that it starts to change. So the difference is from wired, the signal transmission. Wirelessly, we don't have a guided media anymore. It's, it's non-guided. It's not guided. With a wired transmission, whether it's uh, coax or it's twisted pair or it's fiber, that's a guided media. That transmission is only going to travel along that wire. With wireless, it's not guided. It's going to go pretty much wherever the, the atmosphere lets it go. The antenna is what allows it to both be transmitted and received. So, same frequency is required at both the antenna that's sending it as well as the, the antenna that's receiving that signal. They have to operate at the same frequency in order to be able to 
to create that channel and, and in kind be able to make that transition of, of, of sharing data back and forth. So kind of a graphical representation of the connectivity between a couple of different access points. So how do antennas work? Well, they radiate in some kind of a pattern the signal stream, the signal that they're trying to, to share information from or, or receive information to, uh, from. You've got a couple of different types of antenna, a directional antenna versus an omnidirectional antenna. A directional antenna is going to allow you to focus the sending and or receiving from that antenna to or from another antenna. The advantage to that is usually you get longer distance that you can get between uh, a couple of different points in a point-to-point -point communication. However, if you've got a lot of mobile devices, that's fine in a point-to-point -point communication scenario where you're just trying to connect two fixed uh, points. But when you've got things that are mobile, you really need more of an omnidirectional antenna. Why? Because people are moving around with their cell phones. They're moving around with their laptops. The downside is, is the, the uh, signal strength doesn't tend to be as good. The distance doesn't tend to be as good as, as you might get with a, with a directional antenna. But there are unique applications for each one. Each one has its appropriate place. Uh, range is, is, refers to the reachable geographic area that they can reach. Ideally, to get a signal from point A to point B, we'd have a line of sight transmission. That's the best case scenario. We have no interference or less, case for, uh, less uh, probability of interference. So that's what we'd like to have. But the reality is, is we don't. Put a wireless access point in your house, and unless you live you know, on a beach somewhere with no trees or anything like that, you're, you're going to have walls, you're going to have furniture, you're going to have things that are gonna, going to affect that signal. What happens to that signal? Well, it's certain devices that those signals pass through, certain devices that, that uh, absorb those signals, think stealth technology type of stuff, um, and they're, that creates signals. Uh, it creates a situation where signals are subject to three different types of phenomena. Reflection, diffraction, or scattering. And they all affect a signal in different ways. They either bounce that, that signal back to the source, they split that, that signal into secondary ways where part of the signal arrives before or after the rest of the signal, and then scattering where the, diffusion of, where the signal is diffused in a lot of different ways. So, let's see, let's skip ahead one slide to here. So you might have a wireless access point there that's transmitting. It's an omnidirectional antenna. So it's sending signals out all around. Well, some of those signals hit the ceiling and bounce down. Some of the ceilings are going to go straight over here and hit the corner of the table and kind of go everywhere. They just kind of get reflected all over the place. All those various devices in the, the, the house, the facility, wherever, are going to impact that, that signal. Now, it's kind of a mixed bag. Is that good or is that bad? deflection of signals. Um, wireless signals follow different patterns to their destination caused by reflection, diffraction, or scattering. The advantage is it has, those signals have a better chance of reaching their destination. It's almost like they can turn corners, because they kind of are. The disadvantage is if it's not taking that direct sight, that direct line of sight path to its, its destination, that means it's, it's taking longer to get there, so you end up with a, a little bit of a signal delay. Signal degrada degradation, that's similar to what you might see in a wired network. If you have a very long run, it takes longer for that signal to get from point A to point B. And that's, that's not different when it comes to wire, or wireless. Uh, fading, change in signal strength, the electromagnetic energy gets scattered, reflected, and diffracted the further the distance becomes. Attenuation, it refers to the signal weakening, moving away from the transmission antenna. How do we correct that? It's the same as we would have in a wired world. If it's a, a, an analog signal, we want to amplify it. If it's a digital signal, we want to repeat it. Unfortunately, noise becomes a bigger issue with respect to wireless signals. Why? There's nothing to shield wireless signals you know, in terms of shielding or anything like that. But even with unshielded twisted pair, there's a little bit of shielding to protect it from electromagnetic interference. We don't have that in a wireless environment. There's no conduit. There's no protective sheathing or anything like that. So uh, electromagnetic interference can be a real problem to, to wireless networks. Uh, a couple of different ranges that, that are common in the 802.11 world. I say 802.11. Everybody familiar with 802.11? Everybody know what that means? Pretty good? You 
It's a working group, and they kind of set the standards. They work on the various standards. So there's different working groups, 802.11, A, B, uh, G, and et cetera. Um, older ones, 2.4 gigahertz band, uh, operate, or, operate around that 2.4 gigahertz uh, uh, band, had 11 unlicensed communications channels. Unlicensed meant that you as an individual, you buy one of these devices, you don't have to go get a license from the FCC. It's legal for you to operate it because it's a low power device. It's not going to affect uh, uh, anybody, anybody else's devices over a certain distance, things like that. Uh, it's susceptible to interference because it happens to be the same range as certain other types of devices. Things like, I believe, microwaves will put off a signal somewhere in that range. Um, portable phones will, not cell phones, but portable phones uh, operate in that general uh, frequency range. So there's certain devices that can interfere with devices operating in that range. Uh, the 5 gigahertz range is what you see with 802.11g. Um, operates much faster. Uh, 24 unlicensed band. One of the requirements of these, most things operate <clears throat> next to some other type of device, uh, and in this case it's 5 gigahertz range, by weather satellites as well as mil military radar communications. One of the requirements by the FCC for, devi for devices that operate in this range is that they automatically have to adjust channels whenever they detect one of these communications. So you as a user don't have to worry about it, but the manufacturers have to make sure that their devices automatically switch channels if they happen to detect one of those signals in order to not, not affect uh, weather satellites or military radar transmissions. Uh, Narrowband, broadband, and spread spectrum signals. So, We've got all those signals, all those different channels. How do we send data across those channels? Well, narrowband, the transmitter is going to concentrate a signal, every single uh, uh, energy at a single frequency. So at one very specific frequency. Think about the radio. You tune into a specific radio station. That's kind of an example of narrowband. You've got an entire radio dial of frequencies. But a particular radio station is only transmitting on that one frequency. That's an example of narrowband. Versus broadband says, you know what, we've got this range of frequencies. We could transmit a lot more data if we used all those frequencies to send our, our information. So you can send with a lot higher throughput using broadband. Spread spectrum is kind of a security-minded approach to using both of these. Spread spectrum basically says, we've got all these various frequencies that are available to us. What we're going to do is randomly pick a frequency and transmit on that frequency and then hop to another frequency. Now it adds a little bit of confusion in that the sender and the receiver have to know what the next frequency is. They have to constantly adjust together. They have to be synced up together. Um, so the advantage of that is it offers security. Unless somebody knows ahead of time what frequency you're going to jump to next, you can't really listen to the communication. All you do is get bits and pieces. It doesn't make sense. Um, a couple of specific examples of that, FHSS and DSSS. Those are just a couple of specific implementations of that. Fixed versus mobile. Most of the time, we think of mobile. Why? Because we want to sit down and you know, watch a game or whatever with our laptop and, and then be able to get up and go into the kitchen, you do various things, walk around with our wireless device, and, and still remain, remain uh, connected to our network. But there are applications where fixed communications make sense as well. And uh, the next few slides kind of talk about some of those. Uh, fixed communication wireless systems, the transmitter and the receiver locations don't move. They're fixed. Transmitting antenna focuses energy directly toward receiving antenna. It's a point-to-point -point link between two. The, this approach might be used, again, when we talked about earlier, when you've got that, that directed energy, that allows you much greater distance between those two, those two connect uh, connection points. So the advantage is no wasted energy is issued in signals. More energy is used for the signal itself. We're going to come back to this a little bit more here in just a little bit. Mobile communication of wireless systems. Receiver is located anywhere within the tram transmitter's range. The receiver can roam. So you can walk around with your laptop, your cell phone, whatever it happens to be. Gives you that ability to, to really kind of roam around. You know, cars and things like that. The, uh, anybody been on a flight lately? You have internet access in, in, in some flights now. Uh, so it gives you that ability to move around and still have access to, to the internet. 
Um, a couple of different types of wireless LANs. You probably run across the term of ad hoc LAN versus infrastructure mode. An ad hoc LAN doesn't really require a wireless access point. Now, in reality, it really kind of does because we want to connect most wireless LANs to usually to another network, to the internet, and so because of that it requires one. But in an ad hoc configuration, assuming you don't need that connection to the internet, you can have a small network where you just have devices that communicate directly with each other. They don't go through any kind of a wireless access point. And that's what an ad hoc uh, uh, network, wireless network is, is about. It doesn't tend to get used all that much. You can't add a lot of devices to it um, uh, before you start having performance problems, so uh, it doesn't tend to get used very, very often. Most of the time you're going to run into to wireless lines that are in infrastructure mode using an access point. The access point accepts wireless signals from multiple nodes, clients, computers, uh, uh, Xboxes, cell phones, etc., uh, and re retransmits those signals to the, across the network. It uses base stations, wireless routers, wireless gateways, a lot of those have, have them built into them. So in an ad hoc infrastructure, you might have something like that. You don't have the need for that wireless access point. Your various devices on it are all part of the same network, and they communicate directly between each other. In infrastructure mode, though, I'm going to skip ahead just for a second and come back to it. In infrastructure mode, though, you have a wireless access point that coordinates the communications between all the various devices. All the various devices communicate with the access point directly, and then the access point shares that information with the, the client that it's, it's to be sent to, the message is to be sent to. Usually that access point is connected to a switch or a router or whatever to provide internet connectivity. Okay, so access point requires sufficient power strategic placement. What does that mean? That means you don't put the access point way over here because that computer may not be able to connect to it. Ideally, you have it in some sort of centralized location in order to make sure everything can be connected. Uh, wireless LAN access, uh, uh, wireless LAN may include several access points depending on the number of stations. As you add a lot of stations, a wireless access point will become overloaded really relatively quickly, and it depends on how much you're using the network, things of that nature. But you may require, once you start to get somewhere between and I know that's a wide number, but it really depends on your usage. The more clients you have on a wireless network, the more you're going to have a need for additional wireless access points. Mobile networking allows roaming of wireless nodes. The range is dependent upon wireless access method, so which specific uh, wireless uh, um, protocol that we pick, 802.11a, b, uh, etc. Equipment manufacturer, not all equipment manufacturers are the same. I think I've already made that point a little bit, and we'll come back to that again because they use that here as an example. Uh, the office environment, what are the walls made out of? How many walls are there? are there? Things like that. And range, access point range. 300 feet is pretty good. Um, you start getting beyond that, and you're, you're going to run into problems. And that leads us to the, that hidden node problem that I was talking about earlier. If we go back to this right here. Let's say that that was, you know, let's say that right here was our wireless access point right in the middle, and it's 300 feet this way, and it's 300 feet that way. Well, the way it would work is if this device wants to communicate with this device that's way over here, that's 600 feet. What will happen is it will send a message to the wireless access point. The wireless access point forwards it to this one. This one never receives an acknowledgement back, at least not one timely enough. It takes so long for this one to receive the message and issue an acknowledgement back to the one that's way over here. As a result, it doesn't even know about that, that message. So it's, it's referred to as a, wire, a, a hidden node problem because these two nodes don't even see each other. They can't see each other because they're so far apart uh, that they, they don't get their, their uh, transmissions in a timely fashion. So when you start to push those, those uh, specifications uh, to their limits, you start to run into some of those problems. So those specifications do mean, mean things. Uh, can connect two separate LANs, fixed links, uh, using directional antennas between two access points. When you do that, like I said earlier, your distance can be increased significantly. 
certain wireless access points can be configured to operate either unidirectionally, allowing you to do this, or omnidirectionally to allow access to, for, to various nodes. Uh, support, they support the same protocols, uh, operating systems, uh, as wired LANs, and that's what allows you to communicate using both wired and wirelessly on the same network uh, using Ethernet. So here's kind of an example that might, where you might link together two different access points in order to connect a LAN over here and a LAN over here. They happen to use a Linksys router here, uh, a Linksys wireless access point, I should say, uh, which is, I don't know if they did that on purpose or not, but uh, I used to have a wireless access point that allowed you to do that. Depending on the, the mode that you set it in, you could either link two wireless access points together in that fashion to essentially create a wired, what was a wireless network that would connect these two segments together, or you could set it up so that it was a wireless access point to allow your various nodes to, to communicate. You could pick one or the other. And or two, any questions? Uh, wireless technology standard describes the unique functions uh, of that particular uh, of that particular standard, both stand, uh, both physical and data only players. Those differences are specified uh, specified specified. I'll speak one of these days. Specified signaling methods, geographic ranges, in other words, distance, and the frequencies used. They don't. They use. There's a lot of commonality, but there's also some differences in the frequencies that they use. And these are all developed by the IEEE 80211 committee. Wi-Fi is kind of a generic term when we talk about the 80211 series of, of uh, wireless standards. It was an attempt by the, the IEEE committee to do, kind of develop a household name, uh, relating it to hi-fi for, for stereo equipment. Um, and you see that there are several different standards, 80211B, A, G, and N. The book was written a few years ago. It's not a draft anymore. It's been formally a, stand, a, a standard. Uh, although you actually saw a lot of equipment that was sold before it became an official standard. Uh, a lot of the organizations that worked on the standard had, were already selling equipment and hoping that, that it actually became a standard. In some cases, uh, through, through software updates, they could make any modifications that they needed to. Uh, some of the shared characteristics between all these different standards, half duplex. What does that mean? Talked the same thing in the wired world. Can only send or receive but not both at the same time. Yep, you, they can all send in one direction or the other, just not at the same time. Uh, their access method. They are all they all provide the same access method in this world. It's different than in the wired wired world. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. And then the frame format is slightly different. It's the same amongst those, but it's different than in the wired world. Uh, so the access method, 80211 uh, access MAC services. They append a 48-bit or 6-byte physical address to frame, which identifies the source and destination. And this is what really allows it to be compatible with standard Ethernet. Some people will refer to it as wireless Ethernet. It's slight, the frames are slightly different, but the similarities are what allow it to be compatible. Same physical addressing scheme as 802.3, which is Ethernet, and allows an easy combination of the two. So. Wireless devices are not designed for simultaneous transmit and receive, half duplex. They cannot quickly detect collisions. Remember with a walk in, the, in, in Ethernet, we had carrier sense multiple access collision detected. So we detected a collision. How did we fix that? We retransmitted that, that packet. It's not quite as simple in the wire, wire, uh, wireless world. We'll talk about this a little bit more, I think, on the next slide. So this one uses a different access method. Carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance. In other words, we can't really afford collisions in a wireless world. Uh, so we avoid those, those, those collisions in, in, in the first place in an attempt to really minimize any of that type of potential. How do we do that? We send acts. Every transmission has an act. Remember we talked about in the wired, wired world in the Ethernet, that we can get by with not having to send an act every time. We can send multiple uh, transmissions and maybe only have an act every four, or five, six transmissions, whatever we happen to pick. In the wireless world, we send an act to verify every single transmission. That's great. We're really good about making sure those transmissions are going through, 
that's overhead. That means we're reducing the efficiency of our transmissions. So it requires more overhead than 802.3 for, for Ethernet. Uh, the real throughput is less than the theoretical maximum. So when you end up with, say, 802.11g with a th theoretical maximum uh, speed of 54 gig or 54 meg, um, you don't end up with that in reality. In reality, it's about half that. Um, another thing, RTS, CTS, there are certain situations in which you want to have a single client or a single node to be able to claim access to your transmission media for a period of time. You may have a very important transmission that needs to occur. RTS, CTS allows you to claim that, or that, that frequency or that, that transmission for a little bit of time and it's dedicated to that, and that helps to reduce any type of collisions that might occur. Uh, for the most part, it's not something you have to worry about, but the book does kind of mention it. So the process of association. Association is the process of having a client that hasn't accessed a wireless access point before, and it's the process of going through and associating with that access point to gain access to the network or to the Internet. A couple of different approaches. Uh, of scanning, either active scanning or passive scanning. Active scanning, the client, your cell phone, your laptop, or whatever, goes out and looks for the wireless access point. It's looking for SSID numbers. Passive scanning listens for a special signal from the wireless access point. The wireless access point sends out information says, hey, you got a wireless access point. Do you want access? So it's a couple of different approaches, and both are, are, are commonly used. So what is SSID? Service set identifier. It's a unique character string identifying a specific access point. And it's kind of a building block approach is what, what this is going through. You can configure it in the access point, which is probably a good thing. You want to change it from the default from whatever the manufacturer is. It's a little bit of a security issue. A very little, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, they say better security, easier network management. One of the good things about changing it, especially if you're in a large network or even a medium-sized network with multiple access points, it's nice to be able to have an SSID set that you can identify what specific wireless network that is. So if you change the SSID to something meaningful, this is a sales wireless access point or production or whatever it happens to be. That gives you better insight as to which access point you're actually accessing. So it, it, it can ease some of your network management. They say better security, very, very limited better security. You can turn off SSID, um, which is a little bit of, of uh, uh, um, security in, in that it's not opening the window and screaming, hey, I've got a wireless access point, come, come target me. But the reality is anybody's really looking for a network, that's as basic as it, as it gets. Most of the time they can still find it anyway. So it's really not much in the way of, of security. So, But certainly turn off broadcasting just because does provide a little bit. Uh, basic service set, station group, uh, groups sharing an access point. So if all of these computers are connected to a wireless access point, that ESS or basic service set is referring to the, that wireless group of computers that are accessing it. An ESS, extended service set, access point group connecting the same LAN, they share the ESS ID extended service set identifier. What that refers to is as the wireless network starts to get larger and larger, remember we can only accept probably 10 to 100 nodes depending on our usage before we really were requiring too much from that access point. So we need to provide more access points. Well, if we have a different SSID for each access point, we're not going to be able to roam from one to another. It's going to drop a connection and then we're going to have to reestablish a connection and we're going to, we're, we're going to lose connectivity for email or web and, and things like that until that connection is reestablished. Extended service set allows us to set all of them to the same SSID. That allows us to go from one node to the next or from one access point to the next to the next. As long as we're within range of one of them, they all have the same SSID. We are having to still re uh, to each one, but we're not dropping connections from one to the next. When there's multiple uh, access points, it's going to try to find or, or, or associate with the strongest signal with the lowest error rate. 
that's a little bit of a security risk because what happens if you happen to be on the edge of a particular wireless network and somebody connects with it or somebody happens to have a, a wireless access point close to it that has a stronger signal, you might actually be connecting to the wrong access point. So that's a, a potential security risk. So a network with a single BSS, you know, this group of computers here, one access point, multiple BSSs forming an ESS, you have multiple wireless access points that are all going to share the same SSID information. So ESS with several authorized access points must allow the station association with any access point while maintaining network connectivity. So again, you can go from one wireless access point to the next because they have the same SSID information and allows you to roam without dropping connection. It has to do that. It still has to reassociate with that next access point. As the signal drops from the one you're leaving and increases uh, at the access point that you're going towards, you've got to reassociate. It occurs by simply moving uh, or an increase in high error rate. Uh, station scanning feature used to automatically balance transmission loads. Remember your, your um, software that's built into your client is constantly scanning what's going on. If you start ending up having too many, the, the signal starts to drop from one access point and go up from another access point, it's automatically going to take care of that. Well, that signal, trans, that signal uh, strength is also affected by the the amount of bad data that's going through. So if a wireless access point happens to be too busy, even though it, the signal may be a little bit stronger, because of that, of how, many, how much data is being dropped from it, you may actually have a client that associates with a different access point because it's going to get better throughput through that particular one. So it helps to scale that network or balance the load of that network uh, automatically. Any questions so far? Okay. Something we talked about just a little bit ago uh, was this idea of frames that in some ways 802.11 world is very similar to 802.3 world uh, in their use of frames. There's certain modifications to, to handle some of the differences, but there's a lot of similarity and that's what really facilitates the, the uh, uh, being able to run wireless Ethernet versus wired Ethernet. 802.11 network's overhead includes acts, probes, and beacons. Um, they specify the max sublayer frame type, the multiple frame type using groups. So they have control, uh, control, a control group, a management group, and a data group. So the control group is the process of going through association and reassociation. So those various probes and beacon frames, that ties up some of your bandwidth, right? So those are control frames. You've got management frames, all those acts that have to be sent. That, that represents uh, management. Also RTS, CTS, but for the most part you're not going to see that. But certainly the acts are, are going to be, uh, uh, be an issue. And then what you're really interested in is the actual data that's going back and forth. This causes a real problem. It really slows down your network. It really causes uh, a, a, a problem trying to send a lot of data. So a frame might look something like that, and you'll see an awful lot of overhead in that. Frame control, duration, four addresses, which we'll talk about in just a second, sequence control, frame check, and then the actual data itself. So those four addresses, the source address, which makes sense, the destination address, which makes sense. But we're also having to send this wirelessly, too. So the transmitter address and the receiver address. So we're increasing a lot of our header information right there. Um, sequence control field, how large the, the packet fragment, and a frame control field. Um, Wi-Fi share max sublayer characteristics, Wi-Fi different modulation. This is what we've been talking about, so I'll talk about that a little more here in a little bit. So let's talk about the, some of the specific 802.11 uh, um, protocols. 802.11b is actually the first one to hit the market. There's 802.11a, which you would think would come first, and in fact their working group started first. They were just too slow to get to market. 802.11b got to market first, mostly because it was a pretty good compromise. They had some, some fairly decent ideas for being the, the first one to hit the market. Um, operated at the 2.4 gigahertz band, separated into 22 megahertz channels. Throughput was theoretically 11 meg, but because of all that overhead, they're only able to get 
about five meg out of that, which you know is better than running cables in a lot of cases, especially when a lot of your networks at that time were ten meg networks. So it's a you know unless you had need for high speed, it wasn't a bad compromise. Hundred meter node limit, so the distance wasn't that good. It wasn't as good as, as, as wired and uh, wired networks. It's the oldest and least expensive. It's the oldest because they hit market first. Uh, it's least expensive because everybody and his brother made a wireless access point uh, compatible with 802.11b. Um, they say being replaced by 802.11g. This book is a, a few years old. I would say yeah, G and M. So they're, they're probably not going to see a lot of B anymore, except in older applications. 802.11a never really took off at all. It had certain features about it that were were nice, but there were other parts that just did not work. Um, so they were late to market, so it actually came out after B. Operated at the 5 gigahertz band. That was good. What that meant was less interference and things like that. And it had a theoretical throughput of 54 meg. That's great. Realistically, between about 11 and 8, effectively. But the problem was 20 meter node limit. Distance, that really, that really hurt. Um, and so it was more expensive and, and, and less popular more expensive because it wasn't being adopted by practitioners. A lot of practitioners had already gone to B. There, the infrastructure was already there. Why would you replace it? The speed was a little bit better, but it just wasn't enough to compel people to change their equipment. 802.11g was really a nice uh, uh, step forward. It was uh, uh, provided you with that 54 megabit theoretical. Effective was 20 to 25, so it was better than than, than A, and you're back to that 100 meter node range. So you still had that, you got better speed, and uh, you still had the distance. And it was compatible with 802.11b networks. So you didn't have to go out and replace all your equipment. You could simply add on to your network and not have to, to replace all your equipment. You didn't have to get rid of that capital investment. 802.11m has been ratified. Um, and they've been selling them for, for years. They were selling them before it was actually ratified. Primary goal, wireless standard providing much higher effective throughput. Maximum throughput, theoretical, 600 megabits. 600 megabit, even if it's half that, 300 megabit, that's a threat to fast Ethernet. In fact, it is a threat to fast Ethernet. Remember, fast Ethernet's 100 meg, not gigabit. So, uh, again, another advantage, that backward compatibility. This time, not just with the but with G, B, and A. Why? Because it operates at 2.4 gigahertz and or 5 gigahertz. So it's able to operate at both ranges. Um, same about data modulation techniques. Okay. So you know, one of the things you should notice is probably a little bit different. Everybody have an in wireless access pointer? If you, if you don't, one of the things you, first things you should notice is it's got three antennas. It's a little bit different, and that, that means something. Multiple access point antennas may issue signal to one or more receivers at the same time. So they will communicate much faster because it's got more channels with which to operate from. Increases the network throughput and accesses point, access points range. One of the things that it's able to reach really high speeds is it's able to bond uh, channels using two adjacent uh, 20 megahertz uh, channels bonded to make 40 megahertz channels doubles the bandwidth of a single 20 megahertz channel. Um, in fact, actually, it does a little bit more than doubling. One of the ways you keep crosstalk from occurring is you use uh, you use uh, buffers to be able to separate some of the frequencies by just a little bit. Now, not only are you using those 20 megahertz channels, you're able to get rid of one of those band one of those band, uh, um, uh, buffers that's protecting them, so you're actually able to get a little bit more than double. Higher modulation rates, more efficient use of smaller channels and different coding methods. Um, frame aggregation. Something else that you do with 802.11n is frame aggregation. In the world of, the, of wired networks, we talk about jumbo frames. Jumbo frames is the idea that we're going to overload our data packets here in order to have more efficient transmissions. If our transmissions don't have errors, that makes them much more efficient. We don't have to retransmit. 
relative to our header information, they're more efficient. That's what frame aggregation is in the wireless world. It's the same concept where we take multiple frames, we strip away the header information and combine the data together into one single bigger frame with just one header information. And now we're not retransmitting those multiple frames with redundant header information. Maximum throughput really depends what environment are you operating in. If you're operating in a pure 802.11 world, then you're going to get some very good transmission rates. The reality is, is a lot of times we want we don't want to throw away those 802G, 802.11G devices, 802.11B, etc. And so we end up, in exchange for that backwards compatibility, we lose some of those 802.11 .11 features. So we might not not uh, get quite the throughput that we want. But um, you can see actual throughput ranging from 65 to 600 megabits. You're not going to get 600 megabits, but theoretically, anyway. Everybody good on 802.11 stuff? Okay. Personal area networks, really small networks. We talked about LANs, you know, being the size of an office building or, or floor of a building, things of that nature. Bluetooths are, are what are often referred to as a personal area network. Very small in scope, usually a single room, uh, inside a car. You know, it was really originally designed as a cable replacement technology. So you want to get rid of all those cables from your keyboard to your computer, from your mouse to your computer, uh, from your phone to your car, all those types of things. You don't want to have to connect all that stuff. That's where Bluetooth comes in, a personal area network comes in. Uh, they require very little power, cover short ranges. Um, Special interest groups refine and standardize the technology. It's a very slow technology. It does not transmit a lot of data very, very quickly. That's been improved over the years, but it, even, even with some of the improvements relative to what we need for data and the communications, it's just not, uh, as far as us as consumers, not really there. Uh, result, mobile wireless networking standards using FHSS frequency hopping spe spread spectrum, RF signal, 22.4 gigahertz band. So that version 1.1, Maximum through theoretical throughput, one meg. That's that's not a lot. Uh, effective throughput, 7 point, uh, 723 23 kilobits per second. So in terms of sending ones and zeros and you know, all of the various characters that we have from a keyboard to a computer, that's fine. If we were sending video, it wouldn't suffice. So it's designed for personal area networks. In 2004, version 2.0 was released. Um, and you got a, a throughput that was quite a bit higher, double, 2.1 megabits per, per second. Uh, and increased uh, distance, so it went from 10 meters to 30 meters. So now all of a sudden you can start to think about home networking environments where you have wireless printers, for example, that might be you know, on the other side of the house that you can still connect. Uh, you see a lot uh, for cellular phones, phone headsets, computer peripherals, PDAs, etc. So they give you a, a, a table there that kind of gives you a comparison of the various standards. They start out with 802.11b, and they go all the way down to, to Bluetooth version 2.0. You see the frequency ranges, theoretical versus effective throughput. And keep in mind, it, effective is always going to be less than theoretical. Just it, it has to be because of the overhead. And then they give you your the distances that you can see from from those different uh, protocols. So how do you go about actually implementing a wireless LAN? Well, if you're like most people, you just plug up a wireless access point and go with it. Um, but if you're actually designing a, a wireless network, you probably should put a little bit more thought into it. Uh, you can start out with, is by designing a small wireless LAN for your home or small office. That's, it's really kind of a building block approach. So the, a lot of the stuff that you do at that level just kind of gets built on in a larger, larger environment. Formation of larger enterprise-wide WANs. Um, like I said, just is kind of a building block approach where you're adding additional access points. And to a large degree, the, the same techniques apply as you do that. Installing and configuring access points and clients is something you've got to do. Trying to avoid pitfalls, and we'll talk about some of those here in just a second. And then material applies to 802.11. The, the material that they're giving you here in the next few slides applies to 802.11b and g networks. But the reality is, conceptually, it really doesn't matter. The, regardless of the wireless uh, technology that you're using, a lot of the concepts are the same. The scale changes sometimes, but the 
general uh, uh, concepts apply from one to the other. So if you've got one access point, it's really as simple as it's going to get. You combine it with a switch or a router uh, to be able to connect to the internet um, and, and you're in, in good shape. Typical distance between access point and client, um, when you're talking about 802.11g, for example, about 100 meters. So you're really in pretty good shape there in a small environment. When it gets beyond that, then you've got some other considerations. But one of the things you have to worry about are the various types of obstacles. How many obstacles? What are those obstacles made of that's going to impact those wireless access signals? So in a, a basic environment, you might have a wireless access point connected to a cable or DSL modem, which is connected to the Internet, and then you're going to provide access to your, your various uh, machines locally. Larger WANs, wireless WANs, need some kind of a systematic approach. What do we mean by systematic? It means we're going to think about it. We're, yeah, we're going to think about it and systematically apply it. We're going to, to come up with a design that allows us to um, test the results of our design. And that's what the next few slides, or next little bit of this slide is about. Let's start out with a site survey. Something like what we were talking about at the beginning class. Have a, a, some kind of a, of a diagram of, of the, the building various rooms, the, the walls, the structures, things like that. Um, so assess client requirements, facility characteristics, speed, coverage areas, those types of things. Determine access point arrangements and ensuring reliable wire, wireless connectivity. How do you do that? access point arrangement, ensuring reliable wireless activity. The method of actually determining that arrangement, you physically, there's no, you can sit there with a piece of paper and a design all day long. The reality is you got to go out there with an access point, plug it up so it's broadcasting a signal, and go around with some kind of receiver to listen to that signal so you can determine your signal strength. That's what's going to tell you the effect of this particular wall in this location. And then you document that. And the reality is, is you're going to have a lot of paperwork because you're going to have um, a floor pan of, of, of that particular floor or building or whatever over and over again with different readings on it for different locations of that access point as you've moved it around. And you're going to find that depending on the, the various walls that are in a, in a building and where those walls are located, that there's a spot somewhere in that building that's going to be the best place for that access point or for those access points depending on on, on the size of the building. So that's what they're talking about. It's literally, it's a very time consuming thing to do, but when you're talking about designing a wireless LAN properly in a larger scale environment, that's what you end up having to do. Um, proposes access testing, testing wireless access from the farthest corners. That's what you end up having to do overall. The reality is, is you really want to go, once you've done all that, you really, the, the the places that you have to be most concerned about are the furthest parts away from a particular wireless access point. It's usually going to be the corners of the building. Um, install access points must belong to the same ESS if you want the ability to roam. You know, if, if you're just connecting wireless uh, um, uh, nodes, to, fixed nodes to wireless access points, so they're not going to be moving, they don't necessarily have to have the same SSID number. They don't have to be part of the same ESS. If you want to allow that mobility, though, for somebody to be able to go from, from access point to access point without being dropped, then yes, you need to, to have, they all need to be set to the same SSID. Uh, Enterprise-wide wireless LAN design considerations, how wireless LAN portions will integrate with wired portions. In a lot of cases, you end up with a redundant network. You end up with um, a wired network with an overlay of a wired wireless network. You don't necessarily have to have that, but you see that frequently because it, 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 there are a lot of users that do tend to be mobile, and it gives you a lot of, of uh, uh, flexibility for those users to be able to, to get up and, and leave as they, as they need to. And I don't really get this slide, so I'm going to move on. Configuring wireless connectivity devices. They, they must have stock with Netgear or something like that. But 
Uh, popular low cost access point. There's a reason it's low cost. Four switch ports, routing capabilities, supports 802.11b and 802.11g. It might be the one I had. I got one of the early 802.11g ones and it didn't last long. Configuration steps on other small wireless connectivity devices differ somewhat. They're all going to differ. Even, from, even within a manufacturer, from model to model, there may be some similarities, but there's also going to be differences. And they're going to have different features. They just are. So I, I really don't quite get the author's point of going through this because to me there are so many differences and the screens are so significantly different. Uh, they were really big into providing a lot of screenshots, but um, they did. A lot of the, the features that you have built into um, your routers, a lot of times you'll log in via a, a, a browser. They'll type in an address into a browser or sometimes they'll come with a a CD-ROM that you can uh, uh, run, and if you're connected, uh, you can connect to that particular uh, the particular web server that's built into the router uh, wireless access point. You can configure it that way. Uh, in some cases, those wireless access points can be configured via DHCP server. Uh, you can configure, um, for example, access control. You want to lock out certain MAC addresses or only allow certain MAC addresses, you can do that, uh, which I, I would definitely recommend. Uh, you can pick the particular encryption method that you want to use, WPA, WPA2, WEP. Uh, don't use WEP. It's too easy to crack. Uh, you can set it whether or not you want it to use a particular channel or a particular mode. So accepting uh, 802.11b, 802.11g, etc., you can select those. Again, if you want to get the best performance, especially with an 802.11n device, you want to set it to n. Just realize none of those other devices would be able to connect. 802.11g, for example. Um, your access control list. Whether or not you want to broadcast to SSID. Again, it's sort of a security uh, issue, but it's really pretty limited. But uh, honestly, in the secure world, I, I think you should take every step you can, so you should probably turn that off. Uh, you can a lot of times set the, like I said, a DHCP server and set the various addresses that it can can uh, can dole out there. Once you've set up your wireless access point, you also have to configure those clients. Those clients don't automatically just know, hey, there's an access point, go use it. Configuration varies from one client uh, type to another. Most of the Windows XP clients, I personally prefer to just use the, the software that's built into Windows. That's just me. I don't usually like the software that comes with the network card because they're all different. And you know, if you go from machine to machine to machine, I'd just rather see the same software. And so I prefer to use what's built into Windows. Uh, in some cases, the software from the manufacturer is really cool. It allows you to do some other things. But um, I, I just like to see that consistency. So that, that's just me. Uh, Linux and Unix clients also have wireless uh, interface configurations using a, a graphical user interface or the command line. You can do it from either one. For Windows, under win uh, wireless network connection properties, wireless networks, you can there's a checkbox up there to use Windows to configure the wireless uh, network settings. That's where you would, would uh, if you had other software that allowed you to configure the wireless network card, you could uncheck that. Uh, and use that other software, or you can check this and allow Windows to manage that connection. Uh, here's where you can set uh, the association characteristics, the type of network authentication, data encryption, web, WPA, etc. Configuring it um, in uh, Linux or Unix via a, uh, via a command line. So pitfalls to avoid. SSID mismatch. Remember, if you go back to there, you can type in the, the SSID. Well, if you type in the SSID incorrectly, or you know you use an uppercase letter in, in place of a lowercase, it won't connect. SSID is case sensitive. Uh, incorrect encryption. If you select w, WPA in on your your wireless uh, access point, but you select WEP on your client, they're not going to be able to talk to each other. You're speaking two different languages. Uh, incorrect channel or frequency, standard mismatch, 802.11a access point, and you're trying to connect with an 802.11n, for example, uh, um, actually, an 
in wireless access point that's set to only accept in, and then A or 211A device, then it's not going to work. It's not that wireless access point's not looking for A signals. Uh, incorrect antenna placement's an issue. Verify that the client's within 330 feet. And that's really pushing it. Remember, the further you push it, your transmission effectiveness is, at the speed is going to go down. Uh, so that's really pushing it. If you, if you get into those types of situations, you're probably going to be better off to have an additional wireless access point. Uh, and then interference. Check for EMI uh, sources. So machinery, equipment, things like that that will put off uh, those types of signals. Fluorescent lights, for example. Um, let's see. Wireless broadband, the latest wireless WAN technology specifically designed for high throughput, long distance digital data exchange. So, uh, it talks about this. I'll come back to that in just a second. What they're talking about is 802.16. It's another wireless standard. It's not what we normally see, though, in, in, in our home network environments. Um, so, when they talk about 802.11 in internet access, you guys are familiar with all this stuff. Various hotspots. Uh, hotspots are either free or subscription based. You go to the airport, they want to charge you for it. You go to McDonald's, it's free. Um, we know what a hotspot is. A lot of cases you have to log in via a web page. They basically want you to go through the process of agreeing not to violate their use policy. So you're not going to serve up porn, you're not going to sell and, and spam people, etc. Uh, on their network. It's just really there for you to use while you're drinking their Starbucks coffee or whatever. Okay, so back to WiMAX. Uh, worldwide interoperability for microwave access. So 802.16, and it's very similar to the 802.11 series of wireless networks. Various not, uh, uh, letters that come after that to denote different changes in the standards. Improve, improve mobility, quality of service characteristics, digital voice signals, and mobile phone users. <coughs> Functions in 2 and 66 gigahertz range. The higher the range, the, the faster it that potentially can be. Licensed and non-licensed frequencies. What does that mean? That means for in some environments, you actually have to have a license to operate that equipment. So it's not, not all of it uh, can, can we all, us as individuals simply go out and get without a license. Uh, again, a line of sight pass between antennas allow further distances, but there are also uh, applications for non-line of sight pass using 802.16. So the two distinct advantages of wi over Wi-Fi for WiMAX, much greater throughput, faster, at 70 megabits per second. Not the native 211N, but relative to, to the others it is. Much farther range, up to 30 miles. Again, you get close to 30 miles, you're not going to get that kind of speed. But think about rural areas that are too far away to get DSL, or cable doesn't go out there. Uh, so it's a, a definitely an alternative for that. So it's appropriate for MANs and WANs. This is what you see over in Granbury. Anybody from Granbury are familiar with them? They have a, a small MAN, uh, if you will, in their area, and they're operating over Wi-Fi, or not Wi-Fi, uh, uh, not WiMAX. Uh, so highest throughput is achieved over short distances between transceivers. Possible uses are alternatives to DSL or broadband cable. Well suited to rural users, users that are outside of metropolitan areas, uh, because you don't have to run the wires and all that type of stuff. Internet access to mobile computerized devices and, and residential homes. So, in a lot of those devices, if you, in a lot of those situations, if you have, say, a microwave tower, you've got a fixed antenna on top of a house or you know, whatever type of structure you need, you've got a point-to-point -point communication between that uh, that microwave tower and your antenna. And then you can provide internet access in your local area network back to that, so you can send signals back and forth that way. So you avoid having to run that cable from that tower to your house or from wherever to that house, which saves uh, expense significantly. So some examples of, of the antennas that, that might be used. Metropolitan area installation, the home antenna, connectivity devices eliminated. Um, WiMAX commands, extensive connectivity, download data rates faster than home broadband connection, shared service with a portion bandwidth, means you're sharing it with other users. So that's one of the, the downsides to it, is it's similar to, to cable in that respect. 
you're sharing your bandwidth with other users. A drawback is it tends to be expensive. I don't know that that's so much of a drawback anymore. The prices have really come down significantly since what you know, since when they wrote the book. The satellite communications that they talk about now are, are ones that the prices are still relatively high on. Though the prices have actually gotten better on those as well. Um, so normally we think about satellite to, to for telecommunications, for sharing uh, phone calls around the world, or receiving satellite signals from news broadcasts overseas, or for television, you know, being able to watch watch TV. Uh, but I mean, the reality is that we can send all kinds of information across those satellites uh, and provide homes and businesses with internet access. Um, how do those satellites do it? Well. To understand how those satellites do it, there's, there's, you have to understand how those satellites are orbiting the Earth. And it depends on what you're, which specific, and the book argues that, that uh, for Internet access, geosynchronous orbits are the satellites that are used. We'll come back to that in just a second. The geosynchronous orbits are uh, a specific location where a satellite is orbiting the Earth at a fixed location at, a, at the, the correct speed to be able to stay in the same spot in the sky. When we point our satellite dishes for television to, to the dish, that's what we're doing. We're pointing them to the southern sky towards geosynchronous uh, uh, satellites that are rotating around the Earth at the equator. Those are pretty high in altitude. The book argues that those are the ones, and I think that comes up here in a slide or two, argues that those are the ones that are used for, for Internet um, connectivity. I, I've heard differently than that from other sources, so you know, take that kind of with a grain of salt. Um, low Earth orbiting satellites orbit Earth much closer, 100 miles to the you know, 1,240 miles. Not positioned over the equator, they're really positioned more towards the poles. So in our case, instead of pointing south, you point north, uh, back towards the North Pole. So I'm going to give you that. And then you've got medium Earth uh, orbiting satellites. Orbit about 6,000 to 12,000 miles above the surface, not positioned over the equator. They're really more in between, which is kind of where you would expect. The advantage to, the, to each of those is if it's over the equator, it's further up the, because it's higher up from the Earth. It can cover a much larger distance. If it's low Earth orbit over the poles, the coverage distance is much lower. Medium Earth uh, orbit is in between, it has you know, a decent amount of coverage uh, and less propagation delay. So they talk about geosynchronous orbits, uh, orbit satellites, the most popular for satellite internet access. I've heard, <coughs> in contrast, that low Earth orbit was. Why? Because even operating at the speed of light, which is the, the idea that, that radio signals travel at the speed of light in a vacuum space, that over the kind of distances that we're talking about, 22,000 miles, they're created a propagation delay, a delay in the signal. By using low Earth orbit uh, satellites, that propagation delay is reduced. And so that's the argument I've heard behind low Earth orbit uh, satellites being used. Um, so I, I don't know about the book on that one, if, if, how accurate they are on that. Uh, then they talk about five frequency bands that are used for satellites, uh, et cetera. So I'm not real concerned with that. Um, as far as some of the services, subscriber services, small satellite dish with an antenna and a receiver, you're exchanging signals with the provider's satellite network, just like you would with satellite television signals. Uh, for satellite internet service, there's a couple of different approaches, either a dial return arrangement, which is really the older way of doing it. What would happen is, is you would download your information from the satellite. That's great, right? You're getting your signals from, from outer space. That's not how you requested those downloads. Request a web page, you type in www.microsoft.com. It doesn't go up via satellite, it goes up via a dial up modem. So you automatically have a delay built in there because you're going up through a traditional telephone line. A newer approach is using uh, satellite return uh, uh, approaches. You actually use your satellite dish as not only a receiver, it's also a transmitter. You transmit that request uh, back to the satellite directly, and so you end up with better. Less latency, and as, a, as a result, better speed. And graphic there. So this chapter, we talk about wireless LAN architecture characteristics, the various transmission types, uh, various uh, uh, protocols, 802.11a, a, b, c, or a, b, uh, um, n, and g, or g and n. 
Um, small wireless LAN considerations, larger enterprise-wide uh, LAN formation. Installing and configuring access points and clients. Remember, especially as the network grows and you need more wireless access points, it becomes more important to physically carry around an access point and measure the signal strength from different parts of the room. Uh, again, this type of room, it's probably not that big a deal. Throw one up in the middle of the room and you're good. But when you start talking about a huge warehouse or this entire uh, uh, floor, now all of a sudden these walls, doors, etc. start to become an issue. Um, so we talked about some of the pitfalls, SSID being typed in incorrectly, different uh, encryption um, uh, approaches on the access point versus your clients, MANs and WANs, wireless transmission, and then lastly we finished with satellite uh, transmissions. So that was that chapter. I thought that was a, a, a decent chapter. I kind of liked it myself, but you guys might hate it.